Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Lizzie and I work at the Lapworth Museum of Geology at the University of Birmingham. And the Lapworth Museum is hosting this talk today all about life in the Ice Age and mammoth adventure. And you might be able to see that we are joined by Jen. Jen is from Creswell Crags Museum. So the talk today, it's a joint venture between the two museums and um, exploring different parts of life in the Ice Age. Um, now, if you have done a or taken part in a talk with the Lapworth Museum of Geology, you will be familiar with our format. But if you haven't, then um, the way that we like to run our sessions is that you can join in as much as you like through the chat function. So if at any point you want to answer a question that myself or Jen has asked, if you'd like to ask any questions that spring to mind, if you have any other thoughts, questions, comments, you can type those into the chat box um, in Zoom. And to get to that chat box, you can use this little speaker um, or speech bubble down at the bottom. Um, only myself, Jen, and my colleague, Arona, will be able to see what you are typing. Um, myself and Jen will try and answer some of the questions as we go along, but Arona will be able to answer those questions for you as well. So if you ask a question in the chat box, keep an eye on it, and Arona will be there with a fantastic answer for you. Um, we have also turned on the live captioning which Zoom offers. So if you want to be able to read what we're saying as well as listen to it, you can turn on the subtitles. And to do that, um, there's a live transcript button down at the bottom and you can choose to show subtitles. Um, if you don't want the subtitles running and they've started automatically, you can also hide those with, we will say hide subtitles as well. So that's just a little bit of the um, how this session is going to run. Um, if at any point you want to share any pictures of you taking part or any of the facts you found out, then you can tag us in our social media pages, um, Lapworth Museum and Creswell Crags as well. So um, we'd love to see anything that you get up to during the session or anything you find out afterwards as well. Um, so we will make a start now. Um, as I said, we have got two people talking today, me and Jen. And it's going to look something a little bit like this. So first of all, um, I'm going to start by telling us what an ice age is and how ice sheets form and how landscapes can be changed by that ice. And then Jen's going to move on to talking about what life was like in the ice age, both animals and for humans. Um, so yeah, a bit of everything, a mixture of the sciences in this talk today. It's going to be very exciting. Um, you might have had access to our activity sheet and um, you can download this from our website. Arona will share the link if you haven't got it. It's completely optional and um, you can do it as we go along. You could have a go at doing it after the talk. You might not want to do it at all. It's completely up to you. Um, if you would like to have a go, then what you want to do is watch out for these stars on our presentations. We've got five different coloured stars because we've got some different coloured boxes. So if I see a red star somewhere on the screen, it means that there's an answer to this red box here. And Jen and I will try and remember to point them out, but sometimes we forget. So if we do, then just use those observation skills to pick out the stars as well. OK, so without further ado, we will make a start. First of all, um, what do you think of when you hear the words Ice Age? What springs to mind when you think about the words Ice Age or the Ice Age? So we're thinking maybe snow, ice, a big block of ice. Or cold as well. Icebergs and mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. A snowy planet.
So I, I picked out some words. Now you've got lots of other words that you've thought of as well. But sometimes when I think of the phrase Ice Age, I think of cold or hunters maybe on, on the landscape. Maybe mammoths, somebody said mammoths as well. Maybe frozen and this ice, um, glaciers or big ice sheets. Um, I also get pictures in my head as well when I think of the words Ice Age and I start to think about landscapes. There's lots of snow, lots of ice, very blue pictures of our Earth. Um, I also sometimes think of the film Ice Age and, and the animals that are in that film. And as some of you said as well, sort of those hairy mammals, sort of the, the mammoths and the, the hyenas and the saber tooth the tigers, that sort of thing. So these are all what we think about when we think of that phrase, Ice Age. Um, but what actually is an Ice Age? Well, I'm from the Latworth Museum of Geology. So I have the geological um, definition, the geology term for Ice Age here. So an Ice Age is any time when the Earth's air, the Earth's atmosphere, and the surface of the Earth has been cooler for a period of time. And it's been cool enough for ice sheets to form at the North and the South Poles. So here we have a picture of modern day Earth. This is what we see when we see a map of the world. And we've got the North Pole here. And we've got the South Pole here. And even in our modern day, our North and South Poles have got ice on them. You can see here, this is Greenland and it's covered in white. That's just the, the Greenland ice sheet. And down here, this is Antarctica. And the Antarctic ice sheet is the biggest ice sheet on our planet. So from this geological view, from this geology definition, we are actually still in an ice age because we have these ice sheets at the north and the south poles. And the biggest ice sheet on Earth is our Antarctic ice sheet. So if you're doing your activity sheet, you can find that light green box. We've already got an answer for that activity sheet there. Now I know what you're thinking. Um, how can we be in an ice age? Now, it, I'm not seeing mammoths on the landscape and I'm not seeing the cold that I was imagining when I heard the phrase Ice Age. So how can we be in this Ice Age period? Well, sometimes we've actually been told the wrong information and um, it's not always cold during an Ice Age. So Ice Ages actually have warm times and they have cold times in them. It's not a permanently cold period. So on this map, this is a map of a time during this ice age that we're in now. And we can see that at the peaks, at the tops of this graph, this is where the temperature has been quite warm. And then at the bottom, we can see when it's got very cold. So we call these warm times interglacials and that warmer and these colder times these glacial periods are when the landscapes a lot more like what we were thinking of when we heard that word ice age and that's because when we talk about ice ages when people say oh the last ice age they were actually talking about this cold period here so this last ice age it's not an ice age it's the last glacial period, this last very, very cold period. And this last cold period, it lasted from 119,000 years ago and ended about 11,700 years ago. So it's starting to get a little bit warmer again. So when we think about that ice age, we're thinking about this cold period here. And in the last glacial period, our Earth had a lot of ice on it. In fact, 30%, so nearly one third of our whole planet was covered 
in ice, this gigantic ice sheet. And the ice sheet came all the way down southwards from the North Pole way, came all the way down, and it covered as far down south as Bristol. So this is where Bristol would be. And if you are joining us from Birmingham, if you're joining us from the West Midlands, then actually you would have been covered in ice because the ice spread that far down um, the UK. Now, the ice trapped lots and lots of water in it. As we know, ice is frozen water. So lots and lots of fresh water, the water that would normally be in rivers and lakes and streams, that was all trapped in these gigantic ice sheets. And it meant that the sea level was a little bit lower. Um, it was all above in the ice, which meant that our island of the UK wasn't actually an island. In fact, we were connected to the rest of Europe. And nowadays, when we think about the UK, we're completely covered by water. We've got the North Sea here, we've got the English Channel, the French Channel, depending on which side you're on, um, uh, covered with water down here. But during the Ice Age, when the ice was at its most far south, the sea level was so low that our country was linked to Europe. And this bit of land here was called Doggerland. And it was Doggerland which linked the UK to the mainland of Europe. So again, on your activity sheet where you see the red box, the question is about um, what was the land called? It's now underneath the North Sea, but we call this Doggerland. And this is a very important area for life during the Ice Age, something which Jen will talk to you a lot more about later on. Um, so we can see that the ice has spread really far down south. We've got um, ice as far as Birmingham and Bristol, but how does an ice sheet grow? Well, let's have a little look. So how do our ice sheets actually grow this big? How do we get ice sheets from the North Pole spreading all the way down to the UK? Well, it's all to do with how cold the Earth is. So if you think about um, snow, snow falls in winter and then it melts in the summer. So when it's cold, it snows, melts later on. But when our Earth is quite cold in the atmosphere, when the air of our Earth is quite cold, the snow doesn't always melt. So snow falls and makes a layer on the ground. And if it doesn't melt in the summer, then that layer of snow exists all year. So we have that layer of snow and then more snow falls on top of it and makes another layer. And if that doesn't melt, we get more snow, and then more snow, and more snow. And we get lots and lots of layers of snow on top of each other. If that happens over thousands and thousands of years, that is a lot of layers of snow, and it gets very heavy. And the bits at the bottom get squashed down so much that they're not, it's not soft, puffy snow anymore, it becomes very hard, very dense ice. So the bottoms of these layers are becoming ice, they're making our ice sheets. And they become very heavy and they start to move downhill. The bottom of the ice sheet starts to flow. So even if the snow is happening at the top up here, the ice sheets start to move along the ground, they can move downhill towards the sea. And that's how we start to find these gigantic ice sheets forming far, far away from the North or the South Pole. Eventually they move so much, they hit the sea and bits of them break off. Bits of our ice sheet fall off and that's what makes those icebergs that you might've seen on the telly. 
So how do we know how far these ice sheets are spreading? How do we know how big these ice sheets are actually getting? Well, we just need to look at the land because the land leaves uh, traces of what the ice sheet was doing and where the ice sheets were moving. Um, ice sheets are very, 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 very heavy. And they're so heavy that as they move, as they flow downhill, they carve out the land. They, they move huge bits of rock and soil. And they leave shapes in the landscape. So we can have a look at some of those shapes. So first of all, we might find these things called U-shaped valleys. And U-shaped valleys have got steep sides and shallow flat bottoms and another steep side. So just like a U shape when you're writing the letter U. So this is where an ice sheet has moved slowly and it's carved out, it's pushed out all of the rock and soil, moving it out of the way, forming these amazing U-shaped valleys. Now we can find these U-shaped valleys in places in the UK. There's a lot in Scotland. We can even find them in the Lake District, which is about here on our map. So we know that the ice came to at least here because of those U-shaped valleys. We can also look at these bumpy bits of land. Now these bumpy bits of land, they look like mole hills, but they're much bigger. And this is the piles of soil and rock that have been pushed out of the way by the ice sheet as it's pushed downhill. So again, where we find these bumpy moraines, we know that ice sheets were moving by. And we can find these bumpy moraines in places like Cheshire. So we know that they were coming further south here. And the last bit of evidence that we can find or that I'm going to mention are these erratic stones. Now, erratic stones look like gigantic boulders. They are gigantic boulders, but the rock that they're made out of is different to the rock where, they, um, where they're found. And that's because the erratic boulders are giant pieces of rock that got picked up by the ice sheet. They got caught up in the ice sheet somewhere. For example, they could have been all the way from up in Scotland and they've traveled with the ice sheet all the way down. They've been caught up in it, transported, moved along. And when the ice sheet has started to melt, as it started to lose its weight, lose its energy, it's dropped these giant rocks a long way from where they came from. So we can find these gigantic erratic boulders in Birmingham and in Bristol. So they show us where the ice was starting to melt. We can see where the ice maybe had reached the furthest it was going to get to. So these are just three examples of how geology, of how our landscape can tell us about how far our ice sheets managed to reach um, across the globe. And there are other examples. You can find them, um, find out more about it by looking up uh, ice sheets or glaciers. We have glaciers in across the globe in places like the Himalayas. And these ice sheets that are spreading from the North and the South Poles as well. So that's a little bit about the geology, a bit, a bit of geological evidence about the ice sheets. But I'm going to pass over to Jen now is going to tell you even more about the amazing history and life in the Ice Age. Thanks very much, Lizzie. Yep, I'm just going to share my screen with everyone now and tell you a little bit more about life during the last Ice Age. Here we go. All right, so yeah, I work at Creswell Crags Museum. Um, and for those of you that might not be that familiar with Creswell Crags, we are kind of on the border between Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire. So the nearest town is a place called Worksop, but actually the nearest big city to us is Sheffield. So we're in that part of the country. 
And Creswell Crags has a museum, but the museum actually holds lots of objects that were found at the site itself. So in the top left of the side, you can see that's actually Creswell Crags. So you can see a lake in the middle there, but on either side of the lake, is a limestone gorge. So these tall cliffs of limestone and the craggy rocks that give the site its name. Inside those cliffs and crags, there are lots of caves. And those caves have been a bit of a time capsule because lots of things from the last ice age got buried inside them for archeologists to find them. So archeologists, are people that look at the human past, how people lived over millennia. They also uh, work alongside paleontologists. So if anybody's a fan of something like Jurassic Park, really, really ancient animals or plants finding fossils of things like trilobites, paleontologists are interested in early life, which might include early humans, but goes a lot longer back than archaeology does. So they find things like that bone that you see in the picture there. That's actually from inside one of the caves. They find these fossils of animals that were around, but also tools and things made or shaped by humans. And it tells us all about life during that ice age, that cold period. But as Lizzie said, the longer time isn't always cold. So just before that last glacial period, that cold period, we actually have some fossils that were found at Creswell Crags that tell us about that warmer period 120,000 years ago. Now, if you have a look on this uh, picture, you can see there's quite a lot of trees around, things like oak trees and hazel trees, and that the, the uh, water, quite a lot of it here between the crags and the cliffs. But can anybody tell what some of these animals are that were living around Creswell Crags? So we've got one here, these grey animals that have a horn at the front of their face. Now this... Uh, Yep, somebody said a rhinoceros. Excellent. So we had things called narrow-nosed rhinoceros at this time. And in the lake, sploshing around in the water, these grey animals are the same sorts of things that you might find in parts of Africa today. Anybody have any ideas of these water-living grey animals? Hippopotamus, that's right. So narrow-nosed rhinos, hippos. That really tells you that it's warmer than the present day at this time 120,000 years ago, because you certainly wouldn't find hippos living when there were glaciers right next door. They prefer it warm. So things did start to change and the climate got a lot colder. And as Lizzie said, those ice sheets started to grow bigger and bigger. And the, the time that they were at their biggest, they came about this far south. So covering all of Scandinavia, uh, all of Ireland too, and most of the UK. So on the top there with the white, you've got those icy glaciers and that's a picture of a glacier today. Now Ice Age animals, Ice Age people, do you think they actually lived on or near the glaciers or not? What do you reckon? You might uh, have a look at that. Is there anything to eat on there? Does it look a nice place to live. Yeah, you're right. They didn't live on the glaciers. Glaciers are dangerous. And if anybody goes hiking, they're told not to ever try and cross glaciers for that reason. So the animals and the people as well always lived in the areas that were away from the glaciers. And just what those areas were like did depend on just how cold it was, because this is a picture of when the ice sheets were at their biggest. Of course, when it was a little bit warmer, they were further north, further away, and the land changed too. But often when it was cold, the landscape looked a bit like this. So it was very, very open, not that many tall trees, sometimes things like pines or spruce trees, but not a lot of them. It was usually a really open grassland type, type environment that we call a steppe, where we find them in the world today, a cold grassland, like a savanna, but in cold places. But also a tundra 
which we still find in places like northern Scandinavia today, which are almost as open, but they have things like herbs and flowering plants and sometimes small bushes and shrubs of things like juniper. So quite a lot of plants for animals to live on. Not a lot of things that humans could collect, though, and that did change the way that they lived their lives. And on this map, I can show you where Cresswell Crags is. So we just about were underneath the part where the ice came when it came furthest south. And we have records, time capsules in the cave for several moments from these colder times in the last ice age. But first of all, let's talk about some ice age animals, because we know that all sorts of things lived in the area around Cresswell Crags during these cold moments. Now, if you have a look at that uh, <laughs> drawing that I've done, this isn't a life shot. I'm not sure you're going to see them stacked like this animal Jenga. But can anybody recognise perhaps some of these animals and maybe name some of them in the chat? Anybody got any ideas of what were around? Bears, absolutely, yeah. Mammoths, wonderful. Little rabbits, yeah, mountain hares in their white winter coat, brilliant. Woolly rhinoceroses, Arctic foxes. Anybody else? Wolves, excellent. Can anybody tell what the little one is that's in front of the bear? <laughs> Horses, stags, excellent. Things like reindeer, yep. Hyena, excellent. Things like cave lions. Oh, skunk, you're close. It's a closely related to a skunk. It's actually a wolverine, that little one there, a big weasel type animal. Um, and things like little lemmings as well that live in the cold. And um, on the far left with the big pointy teeth, we have a kind of scimitar tooth cat. So you might have heard of saber tooths, and that is the name for all of these big tooth cats. But in Britain during the Ice Age, we had something called a scimitar tooth cat. And the name is kind of similar because saber is a type of sword, and so is a scimitar. So they've named the cats after their big pointy teeth that looked a bit like swords and daggers. And we even found evidence of one of those at Cresswell Crags. So what's the evidence then? How do we know these animals were here? Well, it's from the fossils that they left behind, the things that were found in the caves. So let's have a zoom in and have a quick look at some of these fossils. So you can see the furthest one on the left, that is actually a piece of a jawbone with three teeth in it from one of those hyenas. Next to it, this is a canine. This is a fang from a cave lion. And they've actually taken a sample out of it. You see that bit where it's been cut away? That's gone to a scientific lab and they've used a technique called radiocarbon dating to find out exactly how old it is. And that one is over 30,000 years old. Here, we've got one of the back teeth, a molar from a brown bear. And here, a piece of a jaw, bottom jaw, with several teeth in it from a reindeer. This is a big back tooth, molar tooth, from a woolly rhinoceros. And I love these because you see the little holes in them. To me, it looks like a happy little face going, hey! But they're actually named after the holes in the teeth. The woolly rhinos have a scientific name in Latin, like all things do. And their name is Celodonta antiquitatis. And Celodonta, that first bit, actually means it's got holes in its teeth. So they've named it after that. Antiquitatis means very old. And finally, on the right, this big old flat tooth, that's one of the back teeth, the molars from the woolly mammoth. So that's quite a lot of teeth, isn't it? We don't just find teeth at Cresswell Crags, we find all sorts of other bones, but teeth do survive very well. Why do you think that might be? Why might you find quite a lot of teeth if you're a paleontologist or an archeologist? What is it about teeth that helps them to survive? They're very hard. Yeah, that's right. They've got this coating on the outside, that hard stuff called enamel. And the enamel protects them. They're harder than other bones. Absolutely right. So lots and lots of teeth that tell us about the kinds of animals that were around Cresswell Crags. But 
as I said, we get other bones as well. And sometimes we're even lucky enough to build full skeletons out of them. So this is little Eric. And Eric was a young hyena, only a few months old, that lived in Pinhole Cave. And on the right, you can see the bones of Eric as they were being dug up by one of the archaeologists in the 1980s. And then when other archaeologists looked at the bones, figured out what each of them were like a jigsaw, put them back together to, again, they realised, oh wow, this is a nearly complete skeleton. So this tells us that those hyenas were actually using the caves a lot. They were hunting around the area, but also having their young living in the caves. And we know that the hyenas were one of the main reasons the bones ended up in the caves in the first place. Because hyenas, they hunt, but they also scavenge. So they go out and find bits and pieces that other animals have left behind. Like a cave lion might have taken um, down a reindeer, for example, and left little bones behind. The hyenas didn't mind that it was leftovers. They'd grab the bones, bring them back into their dens and sit and crunch on them like a dog with a bone. They'd actually eat the bones themselves to get to the fat inside. And that would give them lots of energy. So lots of those bones in the caves were actually stashed in there by hyenas. And some of them even have tooth marks from when they were giving them a chew. But other things are left behind from those hyenas as well. Poop. <laughs> Fossilised poop. So this is called a coprolite, which literally means poo stone. And I think they're fantastic things. And they're very white because hyena poo is white. They eat so much bone that they've got so much calcium that comes out in their poo that their poo fossilises just like the bones do. You're absolutely right. They have incredibly strong jaws, especially strong jaws for crunching up bones. And the reason we know it's a young hyena is from looking at those bones. You can tell looking at bones how old something was by how much they've grown. When you were younger, and this applies to any animal and humans too, you have more bones because as you grow, your bones need to have space for everything else to get bigger. So you've actually got little bones on the ends of the bones, which over time join together and make one bone to give it room to grow. So these have lots of the ends. Let's zoom in and show you. You can see the ends of these um, look a bit, what's the word for it, concave. And that's showing you that the bone isn't fully joined together. It's not fused. And if you look at the skull and the jaws, you see there it's got a cross across it, like a hot cross bun. That's actually showing you that the bones that would form the skull haven't joined together yet. And that happens as the animal or human would grow up. So that's how we can tell how old it is. Also from the number of teeth, because they have baby teeth too, and what kinds of teeth have come through. So this is what Creswell Craigs looked like at around that sort of time, about 50,000 years ago. So it is that very open sort of steppe tundra environment. You can see the gorge and the cliffs very clearly, hyenas roaming around, mammoths as well, and other creatures too, like the cave lions and the hyena and things like that that you saw before. But I haven't mentioned people yet. And we know that some Stone Age people were sheltering in the caves at Cresswell at around this time as well. Now, I noticed in the chat somebody knew about this, that there were other kinds of people before Homo sapiens. And at Cresswell Crags, we had these Neanderthal people as the first people that made use of the site. They're called Neanderthals because they're actually named after a valley in Germany. And that valley had some fossils. One of the fossils that was found was part of a skull from one of these people. And so it was called the Neanderthal fossil because the Neander Valley in German is the Neanderthal. It means valley in German. So Neanderthals were a lot like us. They walked upright, 
they could talk. You can see in the picture that the chap there is maybe telling a story, making the other one laugh in the background. They were a bit bulkier though, a little bit shorter, a little bit more muscular. I like to think of them like little rugby players, strong, ready to go and hunt things with spears. And their faces were a little bit different too. They had big heads with big brains showing that they were very intelligent, but also big bushy eyebrows, big bones on their eyebrow region, which stuck out, stuck out quite a lot. Big noses as well. And we know that they were there at Cresswell Crags because they left some of their tools behind. So while they were sheltering in the caves, they were making tools, repairing things. And you can see in the background, the woman that's laughing, maybe at the joke that this guy's telling, is actually holding some things in her hands. These are pieces of stone and a piece of antler from a deer. And what she seems to be doing is showing these young Neanderthals how to flint nap. That's the process of making tools from stone. And the name flint nap has the word flint in it. So flint is actually one of the most famous stones for stone tools. And this is a flint hand axe. Now, quickly to draw your attention to those stars in the bottom of the slide, there are some answers coming up for your activity sheet. Now, a flint hand axe made by a Neanderthal using an antler or a stone, hitting it on either side until you get this sharp flint with cutting edges on it. That is used as a tool. And we know they use them several ways, sometimes to work the wood that they would turn into their spears, but often for cutting meat. If we go back to the earliest slide, you think about how there was so much grass, but not very many trees that might have nuts or things that might have berries. Most of the food that people ate at this time in the Stone Age was meat. So you have to have things like uh, cutting tools, knives and butchery tools, things like uh, a chopper for splitting into bones and getting to the fat that's inside it, which they would make from things like quartzite, pebbles that they'd find around. So like a meat cleaver for breaking up the meat of the reindeer and the bison and the rhinoceros, the other animals that they would hunt. Neanderthals did disappear though. They don't live in our planet today and it is quite mysterious. Archaeologists haven't completely decided what happened to them. If you've got any ideas, have a think about it. Maybe pop some in the chat. So I'll move on to talk about who came after them. And it was us. So we were around as Stone Age people as well. And we came uh, to Cresswell Crags for the first time about 28,000 years ago. And you can see that these people have slightly different toolkits. So they're still using spears, but instead they're tipped with these special stone tools. They look like triangles with a long thin point at the bottom. And we call those font Robert points. They could have been used as spearheads or even knives. But the reason that they've got this thin piece at the bottom, we call that a tang, is to make them nice and easy to haft, which is to put inside that piece of wood to use it as a spear or as a knife. You can see that their clothes, their fashion is very good as well. So we know from other places, like uh, the rest of Europe, which we were joined on to at the time, that people were sometimes buried in clothes that had lots of shell beads or mammoth ivory, tusk beads sewn onto them. So we know that there were very good tailors. And that is a really important thing if you're living in the Ice Age, because to be able to make boots to keep your feet warm, gloves to keep your fingers warm, hoods to keep your head warm, don't go out in winter without your hat on, bags to carry their stuff, that was super important as well. So they had things like bone needles and we can assume that they use things like the sinews or maybe the intestines from animals as the threads. Now, this is not a lot different from what we do today. Of course, our needles today are made of metal, but bone needles were around for a really long time. The Romans used bone needles as well. So a really important bit of kit that they were using at this time in the Ice Age. 
Well, it did change, though. Things started to warm up, and even before the end of the last ice age, you start to see the ice sheets shrinking away. And as they shrink away, it reveals more and more of that open land, dogger land, that Lizzie mentioned before. And we know that people must have gone out into that land because it would have been filled with lovely rivers and lots of the animals like the reindeer and the wild horses that people would need to hunt to eat and stay alive. They would have loved to live in that area. And sometimes today we find fossils and even tools from when they do fishing in the North Sea or trying to get oil. Things get dredged up and dug up and sometimes you find tools from people during the last ice age. And you can see there's lots of caves on this map, but there's also lots of these little shelters. So at this time, people are not just sheltering in caves, but they're making their own homes, using the skins from the animals, using bits of wood when they could find it, to move around, be very mobile, and hunt the resources where they could find them. Now we had an idea about the Neanderthal extinction, maybe they evolved, evolved into humans today. Well we do actually know, scientists can tell from looking at the genes, so the code that makes up an individual, that little bits of those Neanderthal DNA, their genes, have made it into groups of people that live today. So maybe a little bit of them is actually still around, that's right. So. Just before the end of the last ice age, about 12,000 years ago, there was a time that it got a little bit colder again for a moment. And this is a reconstruction at Creswell Crags at about that time. You can see it's very snowy, still quite open with some pine trees in the background. And you can see that there are people trying to shelter in one of the caves with a fire to warm it up. Well, what were they doing at Creswell Crags at that time? They were coming for specific things. There was a reason they wanted to come here. And one of the reasons was those mountain hares, the white rabbit creatures that you saw in that slide. Because mountain hares and their winter furs, it's soft fur, it's bright. They probably wanted that to make things like gloves or hats or lining their boots to try and keep themselves very warm because you can see from that environment or covered in snow very cold very easy to get too cold so they would come up here especially for things like deer especially for things like hares you can also see in the background that she's got a friend hmm so anybody know what that is what's happening here alongside this very long thin spear. That's right, yeah, a wolf. Some people are saying a wolf, a dog, a husky. Well, it is a wolf dog, yeah. So people during the last ice age actually started to tame wolves. All the dogs that live today, they have their ancestry. You can trace it right the way back to grey wolves, which were around people about 30,000 years ago. And maybe some of these wolves, they would come up knowing that people had meat and we'd give them a bit of meat. And eventually we'd have that relationship. They'd start to become more friendly towards us. And many, many thousands of years down the line, we have all the different kinds of dogs that we have in the world today. So a hunting companion probably to begin with. But you can see there are the many inventions that they've got at this point. So he's using a snare, a trap for catching those small hairs, but in the back she's got this very long thin spear and they'd actually invented a way of throwing spears much longer then you would throw them like a javelin. They would use something in that drawing at the top a hooked in shape, a bit like those dog exercises you can get from Poundland where you throw the tennis ball. If you get something long and thin like that, you hook it into the end of your spear and it makes your arm longer. It gives it more power. So they invented this spear thrower called an atl atl by archaeologists. And those long thin spears could be tipped by little stone tools we have these little things that we call Creswell points, little pieces of flint shaped like that. They're actually named after Creswell crags and they might have gone on the end of long spears like that. 
but also antler from deer shaped into harpoon tips with sharp barbs down the sides for going into the animals as well. So they were super inventive, intelligent people and creative too. Now I'm sure you'll have heard about Stone Age cave art, cave paintings, as there are in many places, especially in France and Spain. But at Cresswell, we don't have the paintings. No trace of the paint has really survived on the walls as far as we can tell. Instead, the Stone Age people carved things into the walls at Cresswell Crags. So if they had painted, they would have done it with a natural soil, something called hematite or red ochre. It is a mineral with this bright red colour to it. When you break it down into a dust, it can become a pigment for paint. And in many caves like Lascaux, Altamira, these famous ones with cave paintings, they use this red ochre. But at Creswell, they were using tools called burins like chisels, so a long thin piece of flint with a sharp tip that you could use to chisel away and scrape into the walls. Got a question in the chat, did they use blood to paint? That is a good question. Um, I think it's quite hard to tell sometimes because blood doesn't survive very well in traces on the walls of caves um, and the European caves are very wet. So we don't really see much trace of blood. But I think that in Australia, some of the very old paintings that they have on the sides of rock shelters and places like that, some of those do have traces to, uh, of blood on them. So they probably would have used a range of different pigments. It's just that only some of them survive and not very many in places like Britain where it's very cold and damp. So these are some of the pictures of the engravings, these carvings at Creswell. You can see this one at the top left, that does have a lot of modern graffiti on top of it as well, unfortunately. So the things you can see quite clearly, like PM's initials written on there, underneath it, it says 1948. Well, those are not from the Stone Age because they didn't have writing like we do today or numbers either. But can you see behind there, if I zoom in, there are traces of a deeper but more worn away, so a softer line around this rock. If anybody can maybe tell what this is, a deer, absolutely, someone has spotted it already. So if I do this, it'll bring up the lines of where this Stone Age engraving is. It is a deer. And a reindeer is a very good guess. We think this is actually a red deer, this one, just because of the shape of its chest uh, is slightly different from a reindeer, but it is definitely a deer stag. So in the top right hand corner, let's see if you can figure this one out. Bear with me a second, it's a little bit slow, got it. Now this animal is looking the opposite way, it's looking off to the right. So what do you think this might be? The head over to the right, a big meaty creature, this one. Bull, yes, it is a bison. So this one you can see looks like this, a bison looking into the depths of the cave. And the final one in the bottom corner, this is a slightly different kind of animal. And these are quite rare to see in art of this time because they're not the big meaty creatures that the people would spend a lot of time around. This is using some of the natural shape of the stone as well, a bulge that comes out and some natural lines. Now this one might be a bit trickier. Rabbit, wolf? No, not quite. It might surprise you when I show you this one. It is something unusual. Someone's got it. Well done. It's a bird. It's a long necked, long beaked water bird. And the archaeologists think it's something called an ibis. So those long necked birds that um, stand around in water a lot of the time. And they very cleverly, these Ice Age people, use the natural shapes in the rock and just added to them a little bit with their burin, their carving tool. They also carved on bones as well. And one of the best examples, which is on display at our museum, is a carving on a little piece of bone where they scratched in a horse's head. 
And we know that the people at Creswell were using the ochre paint, not because it survives in the walls of the caves, but because they rubbed it into the lines of this engraved bone. So we call it the ochre horse, and it's 12,600 years old, or thereabouts, the oldest coloured piece of art in Britain. Isn't that fantastic? So that pretty much wraps up me telling you about life in the Ice Age at Creswell Crags. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening and for all of your wonderful answers and questions. <laughs> Jen, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing all of that incredible information from Thank Creswell you. Crags. Honestly, wonderful. Um, are people able to come in visit Creswell Crags now? Are you open? We are, we are open um, and uh, we actually have a mixture of different cave tours available for people at the moment. So you can book onto a private one just with your family bubble or you can book onto public ones where you'd mix with other people. The museum is open so you can actually come and see some of the things I've been talking about like that little uh, ochre horse head. Yeah, so you're all very welcome to come and visit us. That's absolutely fantastic, brilliant. Um, well, again, thank you so much for joining us for our family talk um, today. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, both Jen and myself are happy to stay for a couple of minutes to answer any um, questions that you might have that of things that have been mentioned today. But if not, just as Jen said, thank you so much for joining us um, this afternoon for this uh, talk.